Well, this is the final video of our 20-part series on Bible study. And today, we're going to go through five Bible passages using the steps that we've been talking about in our series. Hello, church. Thank you for a wonderful time of Bible study together. If you're new here, go back and catch up on the other videos to see what this Bibs process means. My name is Ryan Wrench, pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in Temecula, California, and we've been recording videos to try to help our church grow in knowing Jesus. So this is the, the 20th video of a 20-part series on Bible study. Next week, we'll get back to some of our other book reviews and other things from our resource desk and things I've been excited to teach through. But with that, here's the final video. Enjoy this week's video. Well, folks, this is it. This is our final uh, lesson together. I've really, really enjoyed the series. And this is exactly the way that I study the scriptures. And I'm trying to uh, help the church that I'm a part of to study the scriptures. And, and this is one of those things that if we can get this thing down, if we can get Bible study down, It'll change our whole life, and it'll change the life of your church, and it'll change the life of your family. If you can study the scriptures and learn to love the scriptures as the word of God, and if you can take the scriptures home to yourself. And so I, I've spent a lot of my ministry and youth ministry and now pastoring a church just trying to help people bring the Bible home and to understand the scriptures for themselves. And I love the Bible. I love what it does in people's lives. I love the change that it brings to people's lives. And, and I just, I trust the Bible so deeply. I want everybody to know the scriptures and to base their life on the Bible. And I just believe when people will do that, then, then, then everything will will just pretty much fall into place. I'm not talking about circumstances being better. I'm talking about helping us understand our life from God's perspective. Well, that can only come through a, a, a diligent and a faithful study of the scriptures. And so welcome to our 20th and final class as we've already gone through the process. We've already looked at um, a, a certain process that you can follow. We've looked at several different processes, but then these past few lessons have just been sort of a step-by-step -step, um, uh, process of how to study and arrive at a, a rock, a truth, and then apply that truth to our life. And so I want to spend uh, this final class just looking at a few examples that I, I wrote out in the book as I was teaching it in a Christian school locally and teaching it to our uh, youth group, and then now I'm teaching it to our church on Wednesday nights on our midweek Bible study. And so I, I want to take you through um, just the final chapter. There's an appendix at the end, but then uh, chapter 11 in this book is just all solid examples. And we'll go through as many of them as we can, just this final examples chapter. And I have it digitally. I'm going to show that up on the screen, and then we'll go basically line by line through uh, a few of the texts that we visited already, uh, but then a couple of new texts as well if we have time. Some of them will just breeze over really, really quickly, and I'll try to get them up on the screen so that you can see them clearly. Um, uh, but let's look at a few of the examples here. Let's start with a new passage here. This is Psalm 117, as we see... Um, here up in uh, chapter 11, one of these pages, Psalm 117. I'm sorry, this isn't a new passage. This has been the passage that we've been using as our example all along. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people, for his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. And so we've been coming back to this as our, as our example passage over and over. If we start with observation, well, if you look up some information on it, you won't find too much on it. Um, but as a psalm, we're already kind of narrowing that down. And then in the interpretation phase, what we're doing is flagging words. And so we might flag the word great. We might flag the word endureth forever. Um, and we've looked at other words before, merciful, kindness. And, uh, and, and so that is 
steps one and two, and then this flagging words was step three. Now, if we look at step four, we're looking at a general word that this is talking about, and we've already said praise. Well, then step five is a phrase, which we would say this is a psalm about praising the Lord. And, uh, and we would just say, we should praise the Lord. That's what this psalm is about. Well, why should we praise the Lord? That's answered in the text by the, uh, by the verses themselves because of his merciful, because his merciful kindness is great toward us and his truth endure it to all generations. And so those are the answers. The big idea is, is something like this. In your own words, you could put it like this. We should praise the Lord because his mercy is great toward us and his truth endures forever. So if we're looking at that, we want to apply it to our lives. So we stop and think, how is God merciful to me? How does God choose to be merciful toward me? Um, ultimately, we understand that I'm saved and his greatest mercy was in taking the punishment for my sin. And yet he doesn't stop there. He shows his mercy new every day. And so I'm so thankful that not only did he take the ultimate penalty for my sin, but he's long suffering toward my sin even still today. And he allows me chances to repent and forsake my sin and puts people in my life to call me back uh, from my sin. And so, boy, his merciful kindness is great toward me. And not only mercy, but kindness. That's the other word in the text. His kindness is toward us. Not only does he not give me what I deserve, but he also gives me things I don't deserve. And that's a kind thing for God to do. And not only that, but his merciful kindness is great toward me. It's abundant toward me. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing to, uh, to even meditate on, God's merciful kindness being great toward me. So that was the first branch. That was the first aspect of the answer to why should we praise the Lord. The second branch was about the truth of God. So I'm thankful for his word. And I dwell on the truth that God has revealed to me. And we have the truth of creation, according to Romans 1. We have so much truth. Um, uh, just looking all around us, we can learn about God. And then the truth through Jesus Christ that he sent to this world. And then the truth through the word, the scriptures, that it'll endure, that will last forever, that, that nothing can destroy the word of God. What a wonderful thing that we can study the Bible and even have a class like this to study the Bible. And so that's reason to praise the Lord. So his merciful kindness is great toward us and his truth endureth. And when I'm thinking about his mercy and his truth and all of that, then it's like, I can't help but stay, I can't help but, but express thanks to God. I can't be silent about this. I've got to express that to him. And so I would say my response to that is that I would praise the Lord because his merciful kindness is great toward me and his truth endureth. So if I'm looking at something like a plan, okay, God, now that I've studied the scriptures on your truth and your mercy and your kindness, what am I going to do about that so I'm not deceived, so I'm not just um, not just acting like these things are nice things, but what am I going to do differently? Well, maybe I'll attend church this morning and I'm really going to take part in praising uh, the Lord. I want to sing praises to him like I've never sung before. I, I want to let it show on my face. I'm going to choose to smile while I'm praising the Lord. These are, these are examples of ways that I can say, Based on the things that I've studied from the scriptures, here's how I want to actually do it. And so that's a good example from 117, Psalm 117, of how to make the Bible relevant, of how to make it real to today. We looked at Luke chapter 10 as well. And Luke chapter 10 was the story of the Good Samaritan. And we read that in a previous lesson. And we highlighted the phrase where Jesus asked the lawyer, who is I mean, the lawyer asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And he tells the story of the Good Samaritan and then comes back 
at the lawyer and says, well, not who is my neighbor, but who is neighbor unto him? Who is being neighborly? That's the real question. So the real question is love. Go and do thou likewise was what Jesus told this lawyer. And so if we're doing the process of observation, then we're looking at the chapters before this uh, story in the, the, the scriptures of, of Luke. We're looking at the chapters before that kind of led up to this point. We're looking at the whole book in general and uh, looking at the context of that. And, um, uh, and then we dive into the actual interpretation. So verse by verse, we'll flag certain words throughout this. And we might learn a little bit about lawyers. He obviously wasn't looking for um, real answers to questions. He was just trying to trick Jesus and trip him up. And, um, uh, and, and we see in verse 26 that Jesus doesn't even answer. He asks him a question in return. The lawyer knows the Bible. He answers. And, uh, and so Jesus just responds with biblical truth over and over. So as we're picking up on some of these things from uh, these verses, the, uh, the, the question gets asked, who is my neighbor? And then the story of the Good Samaritan happens. And the key phrase in verse number 36 is which one was being the neighbor. So the story of the Good Samaritan is couched as an answer to the question that this lawyer asked Jesus. And the, the meaning of the Good Samaritan story in the flow of the context of the scripture is not necessarily about, um, uh, 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 about meeting people's needs or about caring for the wounded or about not being a racist or not being a hypocrite. Those are all aspects of the story. Uh, but when you're looking at the story in its context, then, then Jesus himself was answering a question from this lawyer. So we look at the whole picture of what's going on, and we're learning a big picture about Christianity or, or real Christianity. And so this lawyer, in a sense, was asking, well, what's real Christianity? And Jesus explains real Christianity by the story of the Good Samaritan, showing that that, that story is a picture of what Christians do. And so he was saying that true love for God overflows into a love for others. And the one that actually showed care for others was, um, uh, was, was what the real meaning of that text is. And so if we arrive at a big idea, well, true love for God should transform the way that we treat others, well, then the application of that is, um, is, is, is different from what the lawyer asked. Well, who's my neighbor? You define to me who I'm supposed to be nice to, and, and then I can figure out how to be a good person. Jesus is saying, well, no, not about this definition. You be kind to everybody, even the ones that can't do anything in return to you. So the application of that <clears throat> is that we can have all the right things to say on the outside, like this lawyer did, but... Um, uh, but true faith in Christ is going to change what you do for the people that can't do anything uh, for you in return. The love should overflow toward, uh, toward everybody in your life. And so the question is, well, wait a minute. Is there somebody that I hate? I mean, someone that's, that's done me very wrong, stolen something from me, hurt me. Is, is there an aspect of hate in my life? Well, that's not the way Jesus was teaching me to be. And so I have to guard against that. If I'm ever unkind to somebody, that's, that's being the opposite of what Jesus was trying to teach here. And so application of this text shows up in questions like, man, how patient am I with others? How compassionate am I being in, in dealing with other people? How much do I care about people's souls? How much would I sacrifice for somebody? So the applications from the text get unpacked from the story of the Good Samaritan, but couched in the bigger picture is what we want to make sure we're not missing. We ask, when was the last time I did something nice for someone who annoyed me? That's a, that's a real life question. That's a real life application of saying this is 
how I want to make the Bible real to me. By what others, uh, by what you do for others, would people say that you're a Christian? Would they be able to look at your life and and say that's that's a loving person, somebody who's being loving to his neighbor, even when they can do nothing in return? That's sort of what Jesus was getting at. Now, Psalm 113 is another good psalm to use as an example. We've looked at um, a story from the Gospels. Now let's go to, back to another psalm. Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. The Lord's name is to be praised. I would say there's kind of a break there. Uh, between verses 1 and 3. Now he goes into a new idea. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. So he's not talking about praising as much anymore, but he's talking about this God that is to be praised. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill that he may set him with princes, wow, even the princes of his people. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. And then we end with what he started with, praise ye the Lord. And, and what a beautiful psalm. I love this psalm. It's packed with so much truth. So if we're doing some observation, we would, we would see that it's a post-exilic thanks psalm. So it's a psalm that's thanking God after the exile. It's part of a set of psalms. If you do a little history reading on this psalm, you'll see that it's part of this, uh, this set of songs that were, uh, uh, were kind of written as, as this, this big group of thanksgiving to God. And so we can divide this psalm up into a few different sections here. And as we go verse by verse, we're realizing that verse number one is about praising the Lord. I mean, it's a pretty simple, straightforward call to praise. And, and blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Just a simple call to praise as the Lord is our focus. He's the one we're thanking. Um, how long? Well, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. We're going to praise Him all day and for all of eternity. And this is an unending kind of praise that we're offering to the Lord. Now it goes into a description in verse number four of who the Lord is and, and how magnificent our Lord is. It's an incredible um, uh, study of Scripture. I love this passage. His glory is above the heavens. That, that's as, as high of the skies as we can imagine. God's glory is even above that. He's so high above all nations. As important as we put world leaders and political leaders, oh, God is so much higher than them. He is so much greater than them. So the first three verses are calling us to praise him. And it's, it's now time to set God against as, as big as we can imagine this life being. Well, God compared to that, there's no comparison. He's so much higher. He's so much better than anything we can even imagine. Who is like unto the Lord our God? It's, it's an easy question. There's nobody like him. There's absolutely nobody like him. He dwelleth on high. So again, we think in terms of status and, and power and people that are on high are the ones that are in control. And the psalmist is saying, well, there's nobody like him. He's so much higher than the rest of this, this earth. It's a it's a rhetorical question. It just, when we think about who God is, he's so much higher than anything we can even imagine. Look at this in verse 6. Who humbleth himself. Humbleth himself. He, he humiliates himself. When? To behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. I've done some hiking. I've seen some beautiful places in the earth. Some of you have done some studies of the skies and you see the heavens and you see how great things are out there and how huge things are and how beautiful this world is in certain parts of, uh, of hiking. 
across the world, you see this magnificent landscape and you think, wow, God created all of this. And Psalm 113, I mean, uh, yeah, 113 verse 6 says that he humbleth himself to behold, to just look at this creation. That's incredible. So uh, humble there is, I'm not making this up. He's talking about a base, to be humbled, to become low, to humiliate. That's, the, that's what this word means. If we flag the word humbleth himself, we're, we're realizing to set in a lower place. There's, there's aspects of the words truly that mean humiliate. Now God, just to look at creation, has to lower himself, has to almost humiliate himself just to behold his creation. As great as we make this life out to be, God says, I'm so much higher than this life that I have to humble myself just to look at it. That's how much, that's how high and how separated he is from creation. That's incredible. To think of God in his proper place is wonderful. But then the psalmist goes on, and in verse number 7, says, That God, He raiseth the poor out of the dust. Wow! God, the creator of the universe that sits so high above all of creation, He, 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 he lowers Himself, He humiliates Himself, He humbleth Himself just to behold creation. That same God reaches down into creation and, and lifts up the poor out of the dust and, and lifts the needy out of the dunghill. You talk about humiliating just to look at creation. What about humiliating to, we could say, get your hands dirty in the dust and in the, the dunghill, the refuse pile? Now, the psalmist here is meditating on words from Hannah. Um, we see this referenced in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And, and so he's quoting, not exact wording, but, but he's talking about, man, I, I've been reflecting on the story of Hannah and, and using some of the same words that she did. And she was thankful to God for reaching down to this, this dunghill, this refuse heap. And she was thanking him for, uh, for that. But not only does he do that, from the lowest possible condition of mankind, verse 8 says that he may set him with princes, with the princes of his people. So these princes are the nobles. Um, that God, the creator of the world, takes somebody out of a dunghill and makes them princes, that's a remarkable change. Um, that's an incredible thing that, that we may not see if we're just kind of reading through the scripture, but you do some, um, you do some flagging of words and you see what these words means. It's like he's giving royal dignity and authority to people from the dust, from the dunghill. Now, we look at that and we say, that's an exaltation that only God can do for us. We can't do that for ourselves. That's incredible. Verse number nine goes a step farther and says further and says the barren woman to keep house. Again, this is a reference to Hannah and God's, um, God's uh, extra special care on somebody who was a barren woman who might have in their culture seemed like she was uh, less than perfect. She was one that was lowly, one that was a sort of outcast because she was not bearing children. So she was left to the side. She was discredited. She was, she was shoved away. But when God honored her request to give her a son, then she was just overjoyed with praise to the Lord for, in essence, reaching down to the dunghill and picking her up and choosing her for such a beautiful purpose. And so we can look at a text like this and say, what an incredible God. He reaches down and, and, and takes Hannah out of her uh, uh, hopeless and helpless situation and lifts her up to a beautiful place. But isn't that what God does for us at salvation too? 
And so the psalm starts with praising, it ends with praising. So if we're looking for a word, I would say the word here is praise. It is talking about uh, God deserving our praise. Well, why? Because of who God is and how high he is and how low we are. So contrasting the, the deity of God and our humanity and the reality of what God uh, does for his people, then sometimes your big idea might be taken from other people. Somebody said God's majesty contrasted with his condescension and gracious dealings toward the humble furnish matter and a call to praise. In, in other words, we could say, think on God and praise his name. If I think about what God has done for me, then, then, I, then man, I want to praise God. The application of praising God might show up then in my prayers. If I'm praying like the, um, the, the Lord taught his disciples to pray, he said, let's start by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed, honored, reverenced, revered be thy name. So um, in prayer, if I'm taking Psalm 113, and I'm looking for application for my life, then I might say something like, okay, this changes the way I pray to God. I should start by hallowing his name. Lift him up to where he is. Oh God, you've, you, you humble yourself just to behold your creation. And so I want to start by recognizing how high you are, how magnificent you are. Just like Jesus taught the disciples to pray by respecting, by reverencing God then an application of Psalm 113 might be just to say, I want to pray by starting with reverence for God, by recognizing that he's so high above this earth and thank him for that. So the application might also overflow into worship of God and it might change um, how we worship God. Worship, worship is just um, acknowledging the worth of somebody, your worship, your worship. Um, and so changing the way I worship, especially on Sundays at a worship service with other believers, then I want to come into a worship service truly lifting God up for who he is and want my worship to be sincere and real and focusing on the God, the creator of the universe, and thank him for what he's done and think great thoughts about him. Think deep, deep re, rich truths about him and thank the Lord for that. And so Psalm 113 has many, many applications of how good God is to us and, and how he must be praised and honored and reverenced. And so worship and prayer might be two examples of that. Philippians 4, you can read that on your own. I'm not going to take the time to do that, but... Um, uh, you know, verse by verse, again, you might flag words along the way and you might realize it's calling us to stand fast in the Lord. So again, we're asking these questions. What is God saying? Uh, it might be something like stand fast. I need to stand fast in the Lord. And then we look at the text and realize it's a how text. How do we stand fast in the Lord? And answer after answer uh, might show up. And so if we summarized it, you read the text, it's talking about knowing, um, not only knowing what God says, but acting on it. And then there'll be specific ways to act on that knowledge of what God wants us to stand for. And so over and over, um, the, the application might be, if I can take the scriptures and actually um, uh, stand on these things, actually stand for God, what's that going to look like in my context, in my uh, in, in my life. Well, maybe it shows up in music, maybe it shows up in, um, in attitudes, whatever, uh, whatever the case. So, um, uh, this, this passage we looked at before, Matthew chapter 20, then uh, uh, again, it might be about servant. We've looked at this one, a servant's greatness. Greatness is in serving others. Well, how can we be great? not by power and authority, like they were looking at, uh, but through service. So the big idea might be, well, Jesus' example shows that only humble service brings greatness. And then we look, okay, God, what do you want me to, 
How can I humbly serve? I don't want power and authority and that to be the focus of my life. But who can I serve today? And you apply that uh, to your life and humility. What, what does that look like in my life? What am I consumed with? What am I serving? What's greatness look like in my life? What do I think greatness is? And compared to scripture, where am I wrong or right? Or where can I be uh, challenged or helped and, and grow in these areas? Now, over and over, whatever passage you're going into, um, you can just study the scriptures, study the scriptures all the time. And, and if it's simple, like one verse, if it's a passage, like three or four verses, if it's a whole chapter, and, and you're getting a big idea from this chapter or this story or this movement of Scripture, uh, the, the point of the Bible study series is saying, how can I take the Bible and make it real life? Oh, I pray that this series has been a help to you. We've covered a whole lot of topics. We've been all over the place. And, and, and I, would just, I would be eager to hear back from you. Uh, I, would, I would be eager to hear how God is working in your life and how the scriptures have helped you and transformed you and how the study of the scriptures clearly in their context have helped you uh, discern from false teaching or have helped you grow in your walk with the Lord. I, I would love to hear from you and uh, it could be through the contact information that's connected to this course that you're watching or just through contacting me directly and personally outside of this course and looking up some contact information uh, uh, just available publicly. Uh, I, I would love to hear from you. Again, I appreciate you. I love you. I want the scriptures to be a help to you. And God bless you as you study the Bible and bring the Bible home. Let it be something that changes you and, and you draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. God bless you as you study the word. Well, thank you for watching this video from our 20-part series on Bible study. I realize this kind of content or our Baptist perspective might not be for everyone, and I don't want to waste your time, but if you did find it helpful or enjoyable, would you subscribe to our channel? We're releasing videos every Monday at noon Pacific Standard Time, and I just want to help you bring the Bible home. So we'll see you maybe in person this Sunday at our church. That's it for now. God bless you, church. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.